In this lesson, I'm going to tell you about Benford's Law, which is a really strange and quite remarkable result that comes from studying logarithms. Credit for discovering Benford's Law goes to an astronomer whose name was Simon Newcomb. Back in the days before we had calculators in all of our pockets, people used to actually use these logarithm tables to actually look up the values of particular logarithms. For example, if somebody wanted to know the logarithm of a number that started with 2, they would pull out the sheets for the log base 2 table. And then they would find the number that they were after, and then look up the value and write it down somewhere. So the story goes that one day, when he was looking up a number for his own use, the pages that started with the number 1 seemed to be a lot more worn out than the pages that started with the number 2. So if the pages that let you look up logarithms of numbers that started with 1 were more worn out, that would indicate that people were using them more. But if people are looking up numbers that start with 1 more frequently, that sort of indicates that there are more numbers that begin with 1 than there are that begin with 2. So then he concluded that numbers that begin with 1 must be more frequent than numbers that begin with 2, 3, 4, or any other number. And he wanted to figure out why. So then the only question to answer is, why? Why is the number 1 showing up more frequently than the number 2, 3, 4, or 5 in the work of everyday astronomers? Now, this can actually be explained in many different ways, but the explanation I really like is to think of the fact that people who use log tables are doing so for a very specific reason. Of course, people are only going to use log tables anytime they want the logarithm of a number. And you're only going to want the logarithm of a number because you're probably comparing numbers that have very, very different magnitudes. So the argument that I'm about to make for why Benford's law must be true follows on from the lesson I did on logarithmic scales. So you should watch that lesson to figure out what a logarithmic scale actually is. In that lesson, I alluded to the fact that data that spans several orders of magnitude, for example like astronomical data, is best drawn on a log graph. So let me draw one to show you this. So this scale over here is the same logarithmic scale that I showed in the last lesson. I'm not going to re-explain it here, because I already did that in the last lesson, but the basic gist of this is that the numbers go up in multiples of 10. But then, we notice something else that's going to be crucial to Benford's law, and that's the fact that between 1 and 2, there's more space than there is between 2 and 3, and then more space between 3 and 4, and so on. The numbers get closer and closer together as you get closer and closer to the number 10. So this bunching over here of these grid lines is going to be crucial to understanding Benford's law. Once Benford's law was first discovered, people started to see it in all kinds of data sets, other than just this astronomical one. People started to see it in electricity bills, and then they also saw it in populations of cities. They saw it in stock values, and also river flow speeds, and all kinds of other stuff. People noticed that it seemed to happen any time the data followed a power law distribution, which I'll tell you about now. To form a power distribution, there's actually a really simple analogy that I can give you to show you where it comes from. The basic idea is that you can imagine this almost like a one-dimensional dartboard, and you're going to throw a whole bunch of darts at this strip. Assuming that every single position all over this dartboard is equally likely, then you're going to get a whole bunch of data that's distributed according to this parallel. So basically, if every single point on a logarithmic scale is equally likely, then you're going to see Benford's law appearing. And that's true for very many distributions out in the wild. Now this does work for astronomical data, because astronomical objects tend to be very different sizes. Stars might be really really big or really small, and planets can be even smaller. Now if you think of every single point on the scale as being equally likely, then we don't really need to look at all these different magnitudes. If you just looked at one particular magnitude, I want you to notice that every piece is just copied over and over and over again. So if we ignored every single part of the logarithmic scale, and just looked at this section over here, then we would be able to see where Benford's law actually comes from. So if these regions are just being copied over and over and over again, then we can do all of our analysis in a single strip, which I've expanded to show here. I want you to imagine this S down here as some scale. For example, it could be the size of different balls, or an electricity bill, or whatever. So if you imagine this almost like an x-axis, and 0 shows up here, then 1 is going to be all the way over here. And we just need to think about where to put 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Well, we know that the log base 10 
of the number 1 is going to be 0. So this number over here is just 0. Similarly, we know that the log base 10 of the number 10 is equal to 1. So this number over here is just 1. But then, to figure out where to put 2, 3, 4, and so on, we just need to take the log base 10 of them. So for example, if we take the log base 10 of 2, we can see that it's just equal to 0 0.30102. So we've written this down on the scale. Then we can figure out where 3 goes as well by also typing it in. And then when we do this, we see that we get 0 0.477. So I've also marked this over here. Now at this point, we just keep typing all of these into a calculator to find their values, and then we can figure out where they actually go on the scale. You can see that 0 0.477 is approximately halfway between 0 and 1, and that's roughly where we've put it. So at this point, I'll just go ahead and write down all the values, and I'll get rid of the calculator. So you can see that I really had to squeeze the numbers in right at the end there. But that's part of the reason why Benford's Law occurs in the first place. If you again think of this whole area like a dartboard again, where you're randomly throwing darts all over the place, then I want you to see that the area between 1 and 2 covers approximately 30% of the whole area. And then after this, the area between 2 and 3 is a little bit smaller, and then between 3 and 4 it's even smaller, and so on. So if you're going to throw darts randomly at this dartboard, you're going to notice that numbers between 1 and 2 occur much more frequently than numbers between say 5 and 6. And that's purely because there is more area for you to hit than there is between 5 and 6. So the conclusion we came to, and indeed the conclusion that Benford came to, is the fact that the spacing between logarithms shrinks as the numbers actually get larger. And for this reason, you'll expect numbers between 1 and 2 more frequently than numbers between say 3 and 4, or anything else. And because this region over here is just repeated in all of these regions, then this continues for any digit starting with 1. But aside from just making vague statements about how likely different parts of this graph are, Benford's law actually allows us to calculate how likely different parts are. So for example, for numbers between 1 and 2, you can just find this by figuring out what the log of 2 equals and then subtracting it from the log of 1, and that's going to give you the length of this region over here. And if you do that, you notice that it's approximately equal to 30.1%. If we then did the same thing for the range between 2 and 3, we could calculate this size by taking the log of 3 and then subtracting the log of 2. So this is the log of 3 and this is the log of 2, and this is approximately equal to 17.6%. So this means that 30% of the time, your darts are going to land between 1 and 2, and 17.6% of the time, your darts will land between 2 and 3. Or to bring this back to the astronomical example, the radius of different astronomical objects will begin with the number 1 30% of the time, and begin with the number 2 17% of the time. So at this point, we could easily populate the rest of the table. But I'm not going to do that, because I'd prefer to show this information on a graph. So let me do that instead. So from this graph we can see that numbers that begin with 1 occur 30.1% of the time. Numbers that start with 2 happen 17.6% of the time. But then after this they drop off pretty quickly. If you start with 3, that happens 12.5% of the time, and so on. So this graph over here is the basic prediction of Benford's law. Any set of data that is randomly distributed across a logarithmic scale should obey Benford's law. Otherwise, it's probably fake data. In fact, Benford's law is such a good way to detect when numbers have been faked that some governments actually use them to detect tax cheats or people who are lying on any forms that involve financial statements. Benford's law works really well for these situations because just like astronomical data, purchases made by a business are equally likely to fall anywhere on this logarithmic scale. Some purchases are really expensive and some are very cheap. So if the business isn't making up the numbers, we would expect that approximately 30.1% of the numbers start with the number 1, and then 17.6% of the numbers start with the number 2, and so on. Now if you just try randomly making up numbers, I can pretty much guarantee you that your numbers will probably not follow Benford's law very well, because humans are not very good at generating random numbers properly. But at this point, I'd just like to summarize everything I've said about Benford's law. Benford's law was discovered by Simon Newcomb, 
when he was looking at logarithmic tables. He noticed that people were looking up numbers that began with the number 1 more frequently than numbers that began with the number 2 or anything else. This led him to conclude that the number 1 was occurring more frequently in astronomical data, and he wasn't really sure why this was occurring. But then, we explained that Benford's law is going to be observed any time data is uniformly distributed across many orders of magnitude. So the likelihood of you picking a number over here on a log scale is pretty much the same as the likelihood of you picking a number here, 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 or basically anywhere. If this is going to be true, then by looking at a single tile, we notice that numbers between 1 and 2 take up much more area than numbers between, say, 5 and 6, or any other interval. And in fact, by calculating the logs of numbers between 1 to 10, we were able to see exactly how much more area was taken up by numbers between 1 and 2. We said that the likelihood of picking a number between 1 and 2 can be calculated by taking the log of 2 and subtracting from the log of 1. So we can just find this number and then subtract this number. And then we did the same thing for the region between 2 and 3. We just find the log of 3 and subtract the log of 2, and this gives us 17%. By repeating this for all other digits, we find this distribution, which is Benford's distribution. So therefore, we're forced to come to the same conclusion as Simon Newcomb. Numbers that begin with 1 are more likely than numbers that begin with 2, 3, 4, or any other number. So Benford's law is really just a byproduct of using logarithmic scales for data that spans lots and lots of different magnitudes. So by understanding Benford's law well, you can learn a fair bit about how log scales work. But at this point, I think I've just about completed everything I wanted to say about Benford's law. Thanks for watching another Trina video! If you want to say thanks, you've got to show your friends. Or maybe you should just visit us at trina.org, where you can track your progress and have access to questions and heaps of other awesome stuff. Or maybe you should just like and subscribe. That works too. But either way, I'll see you next time.